50,000. So you can see how much altitude they keep as they make that and how steep that trajectory will be as they uh, make that final Discovery approach to landing. Houston, take air data to GNC only. GNC only, Hotel. And there's our first uh, affirmation, at least for us, that all communications are A-OK. -okay. This mission Discovery is under Houston, the control of the Johnson Space Center now Contact. in Houston, Texas, which has controlled it ever since it lifted off from the tower in Kennedy. Uh, Lynn Sure is there. Lynn, what does it look like technically from there? Uh, it looks quite as perfect from here as it does from there, Peter. I'd like to point out that uh, Rick Hack, the commander, is wearing that new 70, 80 pound pressure suit, which is an added constraint to them. And these are test suits. They are trying to decide if they want to use them. He gave us a little um, uh, uh, how to yesterday in the air to ground in the video. It's very, very bulky for them right now, and Rick is sitting there not only with all the things that Mort and Joe and Gene and you have talked about, but he's got this extra suit on, and he's going to have to decide when they get back whether it works and whether they want to wear it. He mentioned yesterday in a press conference he's not sure if, well, he wants to look at it in the future and see. So Rick Houck has landed the orbiter at Kennedy, which, as I understand it, is a lot trickier than landing at Edwards Air Force Base, but now he's landing at Edwards on that wide lake bed, but he does have this bulky suit, which is something to think about. Well, and you've, uh, uh, you've led us into a discussion of this mission because, in fact, when I was looking back over the mission for the last couple of days, if there'd been any glitches, Gene Cernan, um, the only one I found was this comment from Rick Houck who said there would be, quote, discussions with the folks on the ground about the survival suits. It's very clear they haven't enjoyed wearing them. Well, it's a case of trading off the risk for, uh, for the uh, encumbrances during a normal flight. It is very uncomfortable. It's very difficult. We had the uh, problem that almost delayed the launch, which was that simple circuit breaker that was tied solely to those suits that they hope they never have to use. A five amp fuse. Five amp Her fuse. energy status is uh, right on the money, which means Discovery is coming right down the exact uh, uh, entry and glide slope that uh, is pre-programmed. and. Uh, preferred her velocity now 1300 feet per second she's at about 62,000 feet there's still greater than the speed of about sound 32 here. miles away from touchdown on runway 17 at edwards air force base gorgeous looking it's a fantastic camera picture and, and they are moving uh, well over mach 1 at this point in time we'll probably get a sonic boom that'll blow a little joe out of his seat down there <laughs> <laughs> in fact that joe and and Mort, that's exactly how people are going to know first of all uh, that the orbiter is back because of a couple of sonic booms right Absolutely. It's almost as if the orbiter were applauding its uh, safe return to Earth. Well, she will intersect the heading alignment circle. She'll be making a left overhead turn. It, there's some precise flying required here, Peter, because as I said earlier, it's 249 degrees. They'll be shooting for It's the an energy management situation. He is a runway. glider, and he has to he has to transfer the energy it in terms of altitude, you know, that she will uh, touch down about above the ground and the speed he has and dissipate it at the right place and under the right conditions and at the right rate so that he touches down at the end of their runway. Now, Edwards Peter, is big. Uh, right. is, Peter, we can see it right overhead here at Edwards now. It's just beginning to make a turn. And, and although Joe says there's lots of runway out there for safety, oh, look. being a pilot, he wants to put it on the end. Per second. Verge of intersecting the heading alignment circle. Oh! There it is. <laughs> That's the second sonic boom there, and of course, those are people on the ground. You can hear them uh, very clearly telling us that the, uh, that the shuttle is now in sight. It appears, of course, to be dropping like a stone well, in many cases. Of course, Discovery is now on the hat. Looks to be going straight down. Well, it's in a bank. It's a left-hand turn. Left -hand turn. turn. It's good. descending very steeply, turning back in towards the runway, and it is it is descending uh, very rapidly. It's it's sort of like a bathtub with wings. Discovery Houston, recommend uh, vector transfer to the BFS. Peter, Translation, please, Joe. Uh, Worth uh, must be seated five miles from the crowd, and you can hear the crowd yeah, cheering the grill, on our the platform. They heard the boom and, uh, and see it very clearly, Roger as do we. Now, Dick Richards, who was with us, uh, one of the shuttle astronauts okay, the other day, said you could actually fly this thing down by computer. Is that correct? That's, it was designed to fly hands-off all the way down to the ground. But That's I don't know correct. I think, uh, Gene, he will fly it. Uh, the computer will fly it until he turns about on to final, and then Rick will take control, control stick steering, we call it, and he'll fly it straight down. So at the moment, the shuttle is still on automatic pilot, in essence. Midway around her uh, left overhead. Yeah, uh, yes. Um, of course, the next major thing is he uh, comes, uh, straightens out and heads in towards the runway is that landing gear. And that's a major component that has to function. 
This looks like an airstrip. Of course, it really is the desert, and they've actually painted black strips on the runway, on, on the desert, to uh, to identify it as a runway. You guys have been talking Flight about how good it is for a landing Discovery base. In fact, it rained out there once, and everybody got terribly nervous that the shuttle would stick now about in the sand, become feet. mud. But today, it is absolutely perfect in all respects. Peter, Peter the Air Force and NASA has an acronym for everything, and. Uh, it is said today that all the FODs have been cleared from the runway. Foreign objects and debris. <laughs> They've done a sweep of the runway. Remember my first uh, recovery of the first shuttle, you can almost feel the presence. The There's something happening as it, it came to this point. Winds are calm. Looks real pretty. <laughs> there it is. 3,000 feet, Discovery will execute her pre-flare maneuver. She's now at about 6,500 feet, descending, descending at a rate of 180 feet per second. Speed, 550 feet per second. One point seven million miles since she left Cape Canaveral four days ago. Gear down and lock the report from Mission Control. All right. Main gear touchdown. Commander out now rotating the nose down, standing by for nose gear and touchdown. You don't come any better. He had like a baby when he let that nose come down. Now, one of the problems they had in earlier landings was applying the brakes on. And everything looks just to have been smooth as silk here. In the distance, the national anthem. Stop, Discovery. Welcome back. A great Stand ending the to the money. new beginning. Thanks a lot. And so Discovery sits at Edwards Air Force Base on this glorious day, and we listen to the final few bars. Discovery, this is Discovery. How do you read? And I read you loud and clear. Discover Houston 1 Delta. Roger. We'd like the secondary controller to off, please. The crew will be out in just a few minutes, Roger. and we'll be back right after this message. Discovery on the ground at Edwards Air Force Base in California. A couple of hours' drive from Los Angeles, a couple of hundred thousand people there. Let's listen now as uh, they talk to ground control at Edwards. Work has been done at Cape Canaveral, the Kennedy Space Center, and at the Johnson Space Center. They are now back. And what an enthusiastic welcome you heard them get at the very first sight. There was a burst of applause from that large crowd, and, and it was sustained applause until Mr. discovery. Control, Houston, the crew now will be engaging in uh, uh, post-landing procedures to save the orbiter and prepare her for the uh, gotten ready to be towed to the hangar uh, at drive. Uh, our unofficial time for main gear touchdown, mission elapsed time. Mission elapsed time, four days, one hour, zero minutes, eight seconds. Our unofficial time for nose wheel gear touchdown, one day, correction, four days, one hour, zero minutes, 18 seconds. 
And we show wheel stop unofficially at four days. There you get some sense of what the pilot and the commander had to look at as they came in that enormous piece of desert on which they landed today. And they now just simply sit there as we look at it from a helicopter. And we can have a look again now at this landing. Four days, one minute, eight seconds after it took off. The gear down in lock, the report from Mission Control. Gear touchdown. Commander out now rotating the nose down, standing by for nose gear and touchdown. What I missed on this occasion, uh, Gene and Turner, was that little aircraft that used to fly alongside and count the feet off the touchdown. He seems to have been able to do it in a different way this time. Well, I was looking for the chase aircraft uh, when we first saw the shuttle coming through about 50,000 feet, but I didn't see them. And I don't know whether they used them on this flight or not. Uh, they certainly didn't uh, didn't make a pass after the shuttle landed. Now, give us some sense. Uh, in fact, let me ask Joe Allen, because you've come down on this particular vehicle. Joe, what goes on at the moment? They won't be out for as long as 30 minutes from now, right? Uh, that's correct. They still have quite a long checklist to go through, and it's mainly turning off equipment. They'll bring it to a point where the orbiter's quite safe uh, and is, is happy to be left for a while. Then they'll come down, and a, a backup crew, support crew, will go in and finish the job. They should be uh, coming down the steps in about 30 minutes. So what are they doing at the moment, Joe? Specifically? Uh, they're, just going, they're going through a post-landing checklist, uh, calling off switches and throwing switches. Uh, we'll hear them also talk from time to time, I would guess, with Houston. One of the impressions we had here, and I asked this to Joe and to Gene particularly, is that it was all gentler in all respects. And on previous missions, we've looked for some of the tiles to be missing from the heat shield. Nothing appears to be missing, at least at this distance so far, Gene. Well, this may be a uh, credibility to the effort and work that was put into this particular space vehicle during the last two and a half years. There's a lot of changes that went in, and some were to the structure of the wing, which I'm sure affected some of those tiles. Joe, did you notice anything at all? Not a thing, Peter. We look at it. We've looked at it through glasses. It looks shiny, brand new. Hard to believe it's traveled uh, nearly, as you say, 1.7 million miles this trip for a total of about 22 million miles. I calculate. Peter, I noticed something. Uh, the unrestrained joy gave way to uh, Joe Allen grabbing his wallet. He says he had a bet with Rick Kalk about landing right on the money, <laughs> right on the mark, and he thinks he lost some big money here. How put it right down, I'm, right about where he was supposed to. I'm happy to lose it. Happy to lose it. <laughs> Well, we won't embarrass you, but they'll take this off now and then. How soon will they get it back to the Kennedy Space Center in Florida? And how long will it take, Joe, to get this thing ready to fly again? Once again, it's not scheduled uh, to fly for several months. The next machine up is Atlantis, if I remember correctly, which will go in November. It's being prepared in Florida right now. Do you have any, uh, more to end, Joe, some final impressions about this overall mission? Well, let me preface it by saying that one of the things that struck me was that Everybody was phenomenally interested in the liftoff, and that caused a rejuvenation in interest of the space program. And then it kind of tapered off until landing. What do you guys think? Well, I think uh, that's bound to happen. There was so much excitement at, uh, at launch time, and there wasn't an awful lot for the astronauts to do beyond the first day when they jettisoned that uh, communication satellite. So I, I think that was natural. Um, it, it, Everything looked as if uh, it had operated almost perfectly on this mission, but frequently, after a few days of examination, NASA comes up with a problem or two that did develop uh, that we just didn't know about. But it sure looked like a great mission to me and probably to you too, Joe. I, so within I, the space agency, it must, have, uh, it must have given people a tremendous boost and a rebirth in many ways. No question about it. Uh, more comments that the timeline was not filled. Uh, NASA had reserved lots of time to troubleshoot problems that they felt would arise in a machine that had not flown for nearly three years. And lo and behold, the cobwebs had been taken out prior to flight. There was nothing, I think, unusual that happened. Uh, the, the crew had time to enjoy the flight a bit, and it, it's a near-perfect uh, mission as far as I can tell. And Lynn Schur at the Johnson Space Center in Houston. What have we learned from this one, Lynn? Well, I think what we learned, Peter, is that never again are we going to say that uh, space flight is operational. If you'll recall, back in July 4th of 1982, Ronald Reagan was there when Columbia landed and said, I declare this operational. Space flight will never be operational in that sense. I don't think that, any, that NASA is going to be in anything but a test mode and a test mentality for a long time. This flight technically cleared away Challenger. And now we can go on, but it's still in the test mode. Peter? Okay, Lynn, thanks very much. And Gene, what are your 
observations at this point i think i know a nation worth